question. Uh, I'm the counterterrorism coordinator for Sweden at the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and I'm extremely pleased to be here because normally for the past month I've attended so many meetings with a focus on core security measures. So I believe that this conference and this meeting is critical for us to develop the link between security and uh, development. Well, I would like to welcome you all to this session on uh, reintegration of dis disengaged and returning fighters. The objective of this session is, of course, to build on the previous one and to discuss and exchange experiences, lessons learned, patterns, trends on the implications of uh, disengaged and returning terrorist fighters where some might still remain a threat, while others might not. And uh, we will focus on available data, on the number of the returning fighters, threat assessments, and of course rehabilitation, as well as on the possible, uh, or uh, as well as on the possible relationship between development interventions and uh, reintegration of disengaged and returning terrorist fighters. Uh, I will shortly introduce our panelists, but after the introduction and after their interventions, I would like to encourage you all to, to participate with questions, comments, your own experience, because uh, that's why we are here, to draw on each other's experiences. But first, I would like to introduce the panel. Richard Barrett, the director uh, for the Global Strategy Network. Richard is the director of Global Strategy Network, a group of policymakers and practitioners working to increase social cohesion and community resilience against violent extremism. You have a long background uh, in the UN and also within the British government. Ilvad Elman, Director of Programs and Development, Elman Peace and Human Rights Center. Ilvad is responsible for designing and overseeing the Elman Peace and Human Rights Center's programs with a broad portfolio focus on human rights, gender justice, protection of civilians, peace and security, and social entrepreneurship. She is also an advocate for the Kofi Annan's foundation, Extremely Together, and has held many prestigious appointments. Cheryl Frank, Program Head of Transnational Threats and International Crime, uh, Crime Program Institute for Security Studies. Cheryl is the program head of the Transnational Threats and International Crime Progr Program at uh, the ISS, an organization that works to promote human security in Africa, and she has previously held position within, of course, the ISS, as well as RAPCAN. Russell Porter, Senior Coordinator for uh, CVE USAD, uh, serves as the USAD Senior Coordinator for CVE, he has a long experience, development experience in uh, uh, crisis prone countries for USAD and is also the adjunct professor at the George Washington University's Elliott School for International Affairs. Mauro Miedico, currently, he currently heads the terrorism prevention branch of UNODC and uh, he currently serves as chair of the working group on countering terrorism financing and is also chair of the working group on legal and criminal justice responses to terrorism. So, let's start with Richard. Please, you have the floor. <coughs> thank you, Frederica, and thank you to the organizers for asking me to join you here today. I thought I'd talk a little bit about the numbers and then about uh, the threat that I reckon foreign fighters, returning foreign fighters may present to us and then about what people are trying to do about that threat. 
Uh, on the numbers, I uh, spent quite a lot of time up till October last year trying to gather official numbers of how many people had gone from each country to join uh, violent extremist groups in Iraq and Syria, how many were still there, how many had been stopped on the way, and how many had come back. Also, of course, there's a, the other category of how many had died, but I didn't think that was particularly relevant to the future. Um, and I discovered in doing that, that although you can gather numbers, they never stay the same. They're extremely slippery. The numbers of people who went, the numbers of people who are still there, and the number of people who came back. Because governments, I think, for themselves don't really know how many people went, particularly in those early years when perhaps the monitoring wasn't particularly effective. And uh, unfortunately, many of them don't really know how many came back. Certainly in some of Western countries, there's been an attempt to, to measure that. And on the whole, it seems that the pattern is that about half the people, or between a third and a half of the people who went, have come back. So in the United Kingdom, for example, we have about a, a, rather more than 850 people who went, and they say about half have come back, and it is in the low 400s who've come back. Uh, in Norway, for example, I think they reckon that somewhere over 80, between 80 and 90 people went, and um, around, well, a bit more than 30, but probably around 40 now have come back, and about I think just over 40, or just under 40, are still there. You know, so one can see that that's, that's a pattern that's repeating. In, in, um, what else? in Spain, for example, though, uh, about 200, over 200 went, and only about 30 are recorded as having come back. Whereas in Morocco, we go back to our uh, half to third type equation, about 1,600 went, and about 670 had come back early, by earlier this, this year. But other countries, even though they try very hard, make it very difficult for us to make any analysis of uh, those who went and those who came back. France, for example, the number of people who went varies according to whether you listen to the interior minister or their uh, DGSE on D DGSI. Uh, anywhere between 1,400 and 2,000 went. Well, that's a hell of a difference. And they only know of about 250 to 300 who've come back. And in Malaysia, for example, where about 100 people are thought to have gone, only eight are recorded to have come back. There's probably a much higher number. So what do, we, what do we make of these numbers? Is it really, in fact, useful at all to have these numbers? Well, I guess it's useful to have some sense of the volume of people who've been going, but not necessarily interesting so much to have the government figures on that, nor on returnees, because governments will offer figures according to whether they want more public support for resources in counterterrorism, whether it's a political issue against their opponents in government, you call someone soft on terrorism, we've got all these returnees, or someone call someone hard on terrorism, we've only got this ma many returnees. There are all sorts of reasons why those numbers may not be particularly accurate, nor up to date. And also I think increasingly the security service professionals are, who know much more about the real numbers, have become much better at using their analysis and looking at the significance of those numbers without calling on other people who are just observing from the outside, whether from an academic or interested point of view, to comment on them. So I think that we have to sort of leave numbers a little, a little bit behind us now, which is a shame because it was become quite a hobby trying to collect um, how many people had gone and come back. But what sort of threat do these people pose? I mean, in, in UK, again, we have about 500, over 500, in fact, active counterterrorism investigations going on at the moment. And that means that there's full-on security service police activity trying to find out what's going on. And you've seen arrests. There have been two arrests last week of people in London on terrorist charges, and it'll go on and on and on for a long time. In fact, the Director General of our Security Service said not so very long ago that there were over 3,000 people on his list of concerned individuals, people that they worried about being involved in terrorism. And that's an enormous problem of resources to even look at them, let alone to follow them around or anything, and it's not going to happen. But in that 3,000, yes, okay, we may have 400 uh, returnees from Syria, Iraq, 
but we don't have any returnee who has actually been involved in a terrorist attack until today. At least I haven't followed the news this morning, but I hope there hasn't been an attack today. Salman Abedi, who committed the Manchester attack just over a year ago, a year and a day ago today, um, went to Libya and to a certain extent was involved in Libyan groups there, but there's no particular evidence that he was involved in Islamic State or another global group like that. Um, in fact, the, one of the attackers of, uh, who killed the soldier in our streets five years and two days ago um, was involved in, to some, in some respect with al-Shabaab in Somalia, but again, he wasn't uh, what I would class as a returning foreign fighter. So are we putting too much emphasis on the threat from uh, foreign fighters? Yes, a lot of those people talked about going to Syria, Iraq and so on, but they didn't actually manage to do so. Um, so we should keep this issue of returnees in perspective and just use it as guidance to, for us to decide why people are joining violent extremist groups and um, what we should do about that. Well, I watched a, a film last Friday, a Norwegian film, in fact, called Recruiting for Jihad. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It just came out and it was the sort of premier, if you like to call it that, in London. Uh, uh, that's a rather grand title for the half dozen of us who were there to watch it. But um, it was an interesting film about a guy called Ubedella Hussein, who was a Norwegian of Pakistan origin, who um, recruiting people to join Islamic State and go away to fight. And I don't know the whole amount of the work he did, but there were two instances of him recruiting people for which he's been charged by Norwegian authorities. And one of them was an innocent young guy, clearly on the edges of criminality, looking for belonging, looking for purpose, looking for meaning, all those things we heard about from the panel before. You know, seemed very, very gentle, went off to Syria and promptly got killed. The other guy, very young, probably about 16, 17, uh, we all fired up by this guy, Obedella Hussein, to go off to join the fight in Syria. But uh, fortunately, the authorities had heard of this, and although they took him to um, Sweden to, to get a flight from there, he nonetheless was arrested at the airport and failed to go. These two guys, complete failures, really, within their own society, looking for something to, to give them a bit of self-esteem and so on, and viciously exploited by this guy who has a certain amount of charisma and certainly didn't himself want to go to Syria, Iraq, because he has or claimed to have some sort of disease which was very nicely treated here for free in Norway. And of course, he wouldn't get that treatment were he to leave to go to Syria, Iraq. And this is the I, I think the problem, and one can talk a lot about what you should do with it, but if I can bring out some sort of final thoughts on this, I think that if you can't engage with the community, then you can't do anything about countering violent extremism. It has to be community-led, because these people, in a way, have rejected their community, they've gone out of the community and they're seeking a community. But having said that, we can't expect the community to welcome these people back when these guys have already rejected them. Even families find it very hard sometimes to have their person come back, um, have their family member come back. So this is, this is a, a big problem. We have to um, help the community as non-community members to not just uh, tolerate these people, but to accept them back and to see them as people who might have a future and might do something useful for the community, I mean. We have also to deal with both the, the pull and the push factors. So there, we have the pull factors of, oh, we'll give you a sense of belonging and purpose and all this. But we also have the push factors of why those people don't feel that where they are already, why they feel discriminated against and so on, um, and alienated, marginalized from their community. Uh, we also have to look at terrorism just as a crime and not too much as something which gathers all of us here together today. You know, these are issues are social issues, and they're social issues which have to be dealt with at all levels of government and all levels of community, including the religious uh, groups and so on. Terrorism is very, very elastic. You know, as it was said earlier, the first session this morning, you can be a terrorist one day and a, and a leader of a government, the, uh, well, not the next, but pretty soon after. And this elasticity of an individual going from petty crime 
into a gang or a cult or a terrorist group and then on into an insurgency perhaps and then the insurgency becoming a government. That's a, a process which could reverse as well. Um, I'd also say that it's very important that we don't uh, stigmatize communities for being responsible for violent extremism. And I think communities are very, very quick to suspect that they are being uh, stigmatized. I very much appreciated that remark that was made earlier, too, about educating for citizenship rather than for counterterrorism. There are lots of other things, I mean, and each of us here could talk for an hour on these subjects, but I think that uh, we'll hear the other panelists and then we'll have a good opportunity to listen to your comments as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the community uh, comes back uh, as critical. Now I would like to invite Ilvad Elman for her uh, intervention for 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Frederica. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for having me and allowing me to share my reflections amongst this very distinguished panel and audience. I was here two years ago at the first global meeting on preventing violent extremism, and I spoke on my work in Somalia with the Elman Peace and Human Rights Center, and particularly on our interventions focused on the disengagement and reintegration of young people and adults that are leaving Al-Shabaab. I spoke on the session which explored the role of youth in the prevention of violent extremism. Since then, the unanimously adopted UN Security Council Resolution 2250, for which the Security Council mandated a progress study, has been tabled at the Security Council last April, and in it, it was highlighted the positive role of young people in peace and security, which includes the role of young people in disengagement and reintegration, both key pillar and priority areas of the resolution. There's a significant shift of the role of young people in the PVE space and a growing legal framework, however slowly, to try to institutionalize our role. Where before our participation and inclusion was very surface level or in areas considered to be non-threatening, there is now a growing openness of the meaningful inclusion of youth. And this includes in spaces such as disengagement and reintegration. But as the UNDP administrator said this morning, it is still quite astonishing how fearful of the youth some governments are, and even more so when they are working in such fields. For a very brief recap on my work in Somalia, the Alman Peace and Human Rights Center has been working on disengagement and reintegration since 1991. When the war broke out, we immediately saw the value and the need to create pathways for young people and adults being conscripted by the warlords as combatants to acquire civilian status and dignified opportunities to reclaim and rebuild their lives. The war has morphed over the past three decades in Somalia, in a way so where the typology and the parties to the conflict changing has been the only constant. But the responsive and preventative potential of a development, human rights, and community-based approach to reintegration and disengagement has not. In fact, our work has always applied emphasis on the individual rec recovery of combatants, as well as instilling transitional justice aims in these interventions for a wider social cohesion and broader political and peace building goal for the affected community at large. This has meant that our interventions in disengagement and reintegrations needed to be more than just a quick fix, more than a six months technical vocational education based rehabilitation attempt while sending youth back to the same environments that were not accepting, enabling or safer for them. The pillars of our model of disengagement and reintegration therefore applied focus on disengagement from violence and rehabilitation with a strong focus on mental health and psychosocial counseling, including alternative mental health techniques, economic reintegration, socioeconomic and political reintegration, and reintegration into the wider society by creating space for these young people who utilize their lived experiences to help others and as a result, forming a new identity, belonging to a new subculture of a peace builder as opposed to a war maker. For the purpose of this conversation, I'd like to focus my remarks on promising practices that can be identified in Africa particularly, in the space of disengagement and reintegration, the civil society responses on effective reintegration, the key challenges, as well as new opportunities that exist in moving this agenda forward. 
Before I get into that, however, I'd like to share some experiences from the UNDP report, The Journey to Extremism, which my organization had the opportunity to conduct the research for in Somalia, as well as facilitating the access in prisons and rehabilitation facilities, and as well as a short film that we saw this morning that was screened on um, the story of a former extremist. What was fascinating in that experience to me, outside of the general journey to extremism, was also the process of leaving. The high awareness and other times complete lack thereof on the government-led national disengagement and reintegration opportunities that existed, including, ap including the amnesty programs. We found that the majority of those that we interviewed ended up defecting with a friend or a relative. It was rarely just one person on their own making the decision to leave the extremist group. We learned that this was because of the uncertainty of the process, the bad press around it, and the many accounts of torture and human rights violations that occurred in those processes that they were, that they were wary about. And the overwhelming response was that they didn't trust the process. What we learned from this, and what I see in my work all the time, is the intentional bypassing of the formal processes led by governments. And as more become disillusioned by the ideology, the tactics, or involvement with extremist groups, the growing interest in defecting through community-based approaches in more informal routes, reliant on networks of thought leaders and grassroots trusted actors. Mr. Akim Steiner also said this morning that we struggle as a community of UN workers, governments, and civil society practitioners to clearly define what or who a terrorist is, as um, Richard had also just mentioned. And in Somalia, what we see is that there's an amnesty program in place. And once it was announced as a means of promoting further defections, what was actually happening in practice was that the lowest hanging fruit, children, young people, not decision makers, foot soldiers, were either being prosecuted, prosecuted to capital punishment, were being used as informants, and getting the most severe type of punishment. Whereas those that have the most blood on their hands were given a hero's welcome, were given power and actual positions of national security. And the message that that sent was that the ambiguity of the system which classifies low-level and high-level defectors at a whim, the need for getting the big names, but also not putting close mind to the, the message that it sends that the majority of those in the field with these armed groups are low-level and have little influence, are being mistreated and sentenced unfairly, is having a dangerous impact on the likelihood of others actually leaving the extremist organizations. So as a result, what we are seeing is that more are being referred to our centers directly by trusted community leaders with an intention to bypass a formal system. A situation that also comes with its own challenges as it causes a lack of trust or competition that doesn't need to be there between government and civil society organizations both working in this space. It calls for greater cooperation and clearly defined roles and responsibilities that do not quite yet exist. And this is not unique to Somalia. The threat posed by violent extremist groups that espouse fundamentalist narratives has grown substantially across Africa. As violent extremism is influenced by a complex set of local, national, regional, and international factors, disengagement and reintegration programs across different contexts, contexts and countries share both commonalities and significant differences. And this is dealing with both national and foreign terrorist fighters. There are varied experiences in how governments build institutional frameworks, how they mobilize resources and respond to radicalization and supporting the transition to civilian life, and the way that the civil society organizations have approached the subject matter. This is further complicated by the fact that the majority of the disengagement reintegration programs objectives have been short term in nature. There also appears to be disagreements on the underlying assumptions of how change actually happens and how to bring about the desired changes in the conceptualization of these programs. And they tend to fall short in meeting the realities on ground and in peace building. Disengagement and reintegration programs are based on the assumption that this will contribute to peace and stability. Yet it seems that the assumption has to be proven on a case by case basis. And in today's increasingly diffuse and complex context of armed conflict, where armed conflicts are characterized by hybrid forms of violence, the different perspectives, constraints, and realities and opportunities in countries in transition from conflict to peace impact how DDR programs and disengagement and reintegration programs are conceived and developed. The discourse on preventing violent extremism places a significant emphasis on prevention. An individual's personal as well as their societal conditions can create both push and pull factors. 
a journey we know all too well as it was highlighted in the journey to extremism. It's argued that somewhere on this path to radicalization, preventative measures can help counter a person becoming engaged in violent extremism. Similarly, making space for civil society is critical. Fostering social cohesion and contributing to socioeconomic stability are important aspects of a successful disengagement and reintegration and peace building effort. Right now, the, we see that there is a potential synergy between countering and preventing violent extremism and disengagement and reintegration programs specifically. It's also clear that the stakes are incredibly high, not only for the individual combatants, but also for countries and regions as a whole. And I think it's time for us to rethink the current frameworks on disengagement and reintegration. To embark on this journey, we are partnering with the UNDP Regional Center for Africa to organize a symposium which will present the crucially important opportunity to explore new creative and locally contextual solutions to help untangle the complex and multi-layered challenges of disengagement and reintegration in Africa. We're building on the outcomes of past disengagement and reintegration related conferences and the main objective of this symposium will be to bring to provide a forum for a consultative discussion on disengagement and reintegration in Africa. We'll convene academics, practitioners, civil society, policymakers, and donors all in the field to advance the development of a new conceptual and practical approach to disengagement and reintegration in the context of a CVE era, focusing on the Africa model. The symposium will take a holistic and integrated community approach to discuss practical and sustainable solutions, which will articulate key principles to form part of a rules of engagement, disengagement, and reintegration across Africa. And as the UN is developing their guidance book on how they do DDR, the symposium outcomes will feed into the work of the UN through the Lessons Handbook. Outcomes will also be reflected in report proceedings, including a compilation of key papers and presentations and other information materials. This presents as an opportunity to standardize our interventions with a clear framework, for now focusing on the African context, but with the potential to serve as a learning basis for other regions too. In conclusion, the complex, challenging environments in which the international community, and the UN particularly, is increasingly asked to support or undertake disengagement reintegration initiatives on the backdrop of this violent extremism era that we find ourselves in, it calls for a radical shift in the modus of operandi and exploring disengagement and reintegration through a community-led proceeding. Thank you very much. I would like to invite Cheryl as the next speaker. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to UNDP for this opportunity to be able to speak about our work in Africa. Um, I would like to make some comments based on observations sitting in meetings such as this, but as well as some emerging findings from some research we're doing to try and map PVE programs um, that are taking place in the Horn of Africa, and we're looking at four countries in that area, and then six countries on the other side of the continent that are equally in trouble in terms of violent extremism. Um, and so I will be just mentioning some of those very early findings um, as, I, as I move through, through this discussion. Um, I think to begin with, um, we, uh, you know, as a general comment, um, everybody that we talk to through research, through these sorts of discussions, accept and acknowledge the range of structural and development factors that are associated with violent extremism and that issues such as poverty, marginalization, disconnection from the economy, uh, disconnection from access to the economy are all factors that are associated with why people find themselves um, in situations where they make choices to commit violence. And I think that earlier presentations, particularly Rebecca's research uh, from this morning and, um, and so on, tell us that, examine those, those in a little bit more detail. I think the question for all of us, though, is as we look at PVE programs and then more specifically reintegration, um, is the recognition that entire communities are overwhelmed by these factors. Entire countries are overwhelmed by these factors. In most cases, people choose not to use violence. However, those grievances do exist for everyone. And how do we create PVE-specific interventions in those incredibly difficult 
um, contexts where um, all where many people have those grievances. In fact, large numbers of people have those grievances. So this is particularly important when we're talking about disengaged disengaging fighters uh, because many of them don't come to the attention of authorities for example. Uh, many of them are going back to their communities and self-reintegrating uh, for want of a better expression of that. Uh, so I want to talk firstly about formalized processes for reintegration and uh, particularly about justice related processes and amnesty programs um, what is being called DDR, et cetera, in some cases. Now, we need to deal with a complex range of factors when we talk about, about these formalized, somewhat formalized pr processes in many places. And the first is um, our international obligation to bring people to justice. Uh, or suspects to justice who have com uh, who are believed to have committed um, violent offences. Um, we're also dealing with a history of amnesty programs, for example, um, having been difficult and difficult to Im implement, and some of the missteps that Ilman has just uh, referred to, particularly in the Horn, um, and some of what we see um, in other part in the Lake Chad Basin. Um, should cause us to pause and ask about how these amnesty programs need to be structured in the future and so on. Um, there is significant, there has been significant resistance to amnesty programs, for example, in Nigeria. People raising questions about do we open the doors for other forms of violent groups, armed groups, um, to believe that they can get away with the violence that they have been perpetrating. Um, my colleague who's sitting here has been highlighting, um, for example, the herdsman issue in Nigeria and how much violence, uh, how much people are suffering under that uh, particular set of circumstances. And, and that possibly emerging as a new crisis for Nigeria. Um, and then I, there's also, the, in, for example, Nigeria itself, the MEND situation in the south, um, which was also the subject of amnesty programs, of payments for people to disengage from violent activities targeted at particularly the oil industry. We saw some of the results of that. Um, one specific example that we talk about a lot in Africa, and particularly in South Africa, is... Uh, is the payments made, the amnesty given to um, Henry Oka, who disengaged from MEND activities, moved to South Africa, um, moved to uh, Mozambique and conducted some activities, was returned to Nigeria um, and came back to South Africa and perpetrated, was in fact charged in and convicted of 13 terrorism offences committed again in Nigeria from South Africa, um, sentenced to 24 years in prison, but still fighting in the courts from, 20, from that conviction in 2013 um, to, um, against the unfairness of all of this. So there are some examples of amnesty um, programs that are just not seeming to work. So um, a lot of the organizations we talked to in Nigeria and Niger are particularly attuned to these issues. So I think for us, we need to be starting to consider that people want justice and accountability. Um, and we need to consider the range of ways that that can be provided, um, aside from just plain old prosecutions, which seem to be impractical under many of the circumstances we deal with. Um, and I'm thinking particularly about traditional justice approaches, restorative justice approaches that can be applied to the circumstances. The second issue I want to deal with is really about how we create this evidence base and how we work towards this evidence base that we all want to start see emerging in PVE. Um, the, from the research that we do, we see that they are often very tenuous links between what is described and researched as the dynamics relating to violent extremism and then those um, the program interventions that are actually undertaken. 
Um, and in these cases, I want to make a strong argument for donors to um, focus on building evaluations into programs from the beginning and not after the fact. Um, for us to be able to design programs based on evidence. Now, these are all very generic, um, t uh, generic, generic uh, comments to make. However, it's clear that um, as we do this evidence building, we're also not really learning from other fields. The criminal violence prevention field, which has produced a decades of data on the reintegration of violent offenders, for example, um, seems to be ignored in the, in the context of what we do. And they've been very good at designing interventions based on local and structural factors, um, considering risk and resilience in design, um, supporting individuals and communities, focusing on issues such as dignity and self-respect and um, receptive communities. So I think that it's time to um, let go of some of our assumptions about the exceptionalism of violent extremism from other forms of violence that we see across the world. Um, there are overlaps, there are issues that are very similar and we need to be making sure that our evidence base is building from there. And then as a final comment, I just want to say that um, you know, we talked this morning a little bit about where we go from here. You know, how do we build societies that accept difference and that deal with the range of um, structural factors that we see that are so problematic? Um, and, you know, we talked about, I think that it's a, a part of our job as PVE practitioners is to assert an intolerance for a range of issues and particularly as citizens we need to assert intolerance for abusive state actors, um, for actors that operate outside of the rule of law. We need to assert intolerance for corrupt officials, for all those range of things we are now seeing as the factors that drive our problem. So maybe let me stop there. Thank you. Russell, please. Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you for including me in the panel, and it's a real pleasure to be here. I, I also was here uh, a couple of years ago when uh, the first of these events happened, um, and I'm proud to be back a second time. Uh, and. Um, I want to talk today about something that uh, many of you privately have heard me talk about for quite some time, which is the reintegration of former combatants. Um, and I want to use my remarks today to talk, um, to address the questions related to development interventions and the promising practices of effective reintegration. Um, there's been a significant amount of international attention focus on this through UNODC, UNDP, of course, uh, the Global Counterterrorism Forum, uh, as well as many others. And the importance of, uh, particularly on the importance, importance of rehabilitation and reintegration in prison-based settings as part of a criminal justice sector. But the development community, however, is still working through the application of traditional post-conflict um, disarmament demobilization and reintegration, DDR, uh, and this new problem of what to do with former terrorist fighters. So th this is exacerbated by places defined by ongoing conflict uh, and insurgency where combatants are locally recruited, and then sometimes you have foreign fighters who are there uh, and, and within the community, and it's become very disruptive. So uh, just to make this really lawyerly, because I'm not one, um, Let's talk a minute about definitions, because uh, as someone said this morning, the, the, the UN had a hard time, maybe still does, defining what terrorism actually is. Um, some of these words, uh, we have spent a lot of time at State and AID trying to define what they are for us, uh, and it has really resulted in a lot of time and effort. So um, forgive me for reading some of this, but um, I don't want to get it wrong since we spent so much time on it. Um, <clears throat> defection. When an individual voluntarily renounces 
association with an armed group and may cooperate to some degree in actions against it. Demobilization refers to a formal process in which members of an armed group, including foreign terrorist organizations, are officially discharged from the group or organization. Disengagement, uh, when an individual voluntarily reduces and eventually ceases active par participation in an armed group, but in some cases may still remain sympathetic to the general belief system. Um, and de-radicalization, when an in individual no longer believes that violence is an acceptable means of expressing his or her beliefs or ideology. And then reintegration refers to the formal process of assisting former combatants of armed groups and receiving communities. Um, at State and USAID, we're now referring to this as 4DR. There are four Ds and an R, so 4DR. Uh, instead of DDR, we're seeing this as slightly different than uh, the DDR approach because we're dealing with people who are former combatants uh, of foreign terrorist organizations. I think that, that when we look at, at this in a, in a lessons learned environment, what we're trying to do is, is, is to figure out what are the key differences? And, the, and, the, and because we do have a lot to learn from our past experiences, USAID has been involved in DDR activities for th over 30 years. We've worked in Haiti and Colombia, Congo, Liberia. Uh, we provided some assistance in Afghanistan. Um, and where I think we've, and in, as well as the Balkans, where I've seen, where we have seen this go well, uh, we've seen a reduced conflict down the road. Where we've seen a go poorly, we have seen a resurgence of conflict and violence. And so getting this right is really critical to the future success of peace if we are to move this forward. Um, and so some of the lessons learned, that let me just sort of uh, go through quickly from our perspective. Um, preconditions matter. And this is the hardest part of what we're trying to do here because there aren't really preconditions. Normally, a successful DDR approach would involve uh, a, a signed peace agreement. Um, which often would set the terms for combatants, uh, how they would be treated in a legal framework, along with uh, processes for an eligibility criteria. And normally someone like the UN uh, and often UNDP would be the guarantors of the people who are arbitrating the process. Um, that's not happening and it's not happening with uh, Boko Haram, it's not happening with Al Qaeda, it's not happening with ISIS. I don't think that we see a likely peace agreement coming, coming to fruition there at any time soon. So it makes dealing and the disposition of foreign fighters more difficult. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's also more difficult, uh, legally speaking, because um, we don't have, since there's no agreement, we don't have an agreed of when someone is actually out of these organizations. What do they have to do? Do they have to sign an agreement? Do they have to um, go in front of the family and their community? How is it that we know that they're no longer there? And there's a great fear from our side, from all of our sides, of making a mistake. We don't want to provide assistance to someone who has would later go and become a committed terrorist act in the future because that would be a tremendous reputational risk to all of us if our organization, whether it's AID or the, or the Canadians or the UN, uh, were to provide assistance, that person then goes later and then the press later comes back to you and says, but you provided assistance to this guy who became a terrorist or woman. Um, I think that, that, that um, the other thing, and, and I think that, that Ilwad got to this, is that the whole community is affected and that um, these environments are still rife with conflict in many of the places where we're operating. Crime and violence in which families have been torn apart, uh, women and children and probably most men have been victimized, brutalized, um, many women extorted and manipulated in some cases. They've lost their homes, members of their families. And so then to accept these people back into their society is, is quite difficult because the community itself is still healing from the, what, the acts of those perpetrators. So in places we're talking about, um, programs for defectors and, and, and those who have been disengaged can miss the mark if it's not a community-based approach, as Ilwan was saying. Um, at USAID, we've been adapting our traditional community-based 
reintegration approaches uh, for that very reason. Uh, Community-based reintegration is more than just preparing the community to receive these ex-combatants. Rather, it recognizes that everyone has suffered and the benefits cannot just be offered to the spoilers alone. And in some cases, particularly in Nigeria, communities are extremely reticent to accept anyone affiliated with Boko Haram or ISIS West Africa back into their society, including those who have been forcibly recruited and kidnapped. I mean, we've seen that directly with the uh, Chibok girls uh, and their difficulty in society bringing them back. So a lot of our efforts have been spent on both sides of the equation of the community. Um, disengagement uh, cannot be a standalone effort. Uh, historically, DDR was never designed to be a standalone activity. It was always meant to be to facilitate a larger war to peace transition. Um, next, uh, joining and leaving are two very different things. Uh, from interviews from formers, we know one thing, the reasons for leaving the fight are often quite different from the reasons for joining. Sometimes they were captured, sometimes it was a family member who was the one that joined or a friend, that person was killed or, uh, or, or, or captured and so they've decided to leave. Understanding why people leave uh, is a key to understanding both um, what to do with them next and how to reintegrate them back into society. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all approach, as uh, Iowa was also saying, uh, that, that we need to be able to understand the conditions on the ground and in that community. And so, in fact, the, the conditions that may exist uh, in one part of Nigeria, for example, of reintegration may not exist in another, and the same in Somalia, and the same in uh, countries where people are coming back to, like Morocco or Central Asia, where they weren't war affected at all. And so I think sort of understanding the difference in those contexts are, are, is, is really important. We have to think a bit beyond criminal justice, um, where the priority for our disengagement programs have been to help partners establish this legal framework and processes, um, that in particular, uh, transitional justice, including both formal and informal processes, can be important. Uh, where we've seen in some communities, for example, in Liberia uh, and Sierra Leone, where people had to come back and apologize to their community, the community had to accept them. Those sorts of transitional and restorative justice activities have been very important in moving this forward. Um, psychosocial help uh, is often overlooked. It's uh, there are often very few NGOs that can do this, um, and there are very few people on the ground that can do it. I think, uh, but it's also key to, to working with some of these individuals and knowing who would benefit most from that and being able to separate that out is, is important. Um, and then finally, um, I guess it goes without saying, as most of you know, funding for this sort of thing is usually uh, hard to find. We generally find that funding for development activities is highest when we're in the midst of conflict, and when the conflict is over, it's very difficult for us to find the funding to uh, support these sort of post-conflict transitions, and I think that, that this is part of that post-conflict transition, and it's something that we need to be focused on, and I think advocating for those of us in this room who are here, because if not, uh, we're just, going to keep doing the same thing in these same places. So, thank you. Yeah, we need to think beyond criminal justice, but Maria, I think you might be uh, delivering something on the criminal justice. Thanks. Thank you, Federica, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, let me, at the outset, to particularly thank uh, UNDP for inviting uh, my office, uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, to be here. And for those who do not know you know DC, uh, we are uh, the lead agency within the UN family that deals with uh, legal and criminal justice uh, responses to terrorism. So, of course, we do counter-terrorism programming and uh, technical assistance. And uh, maybe as uh, Under Secretary General Frankov uh, highlighted this morning, we have some problems uh, with uh, the names of our institution, because the branch, this, the department I lead, it's called Terrorist Prevention Branch, while we do much more of counter-terrorist work. But this actually uh, was one of the reasons why we pushed so much for recognizing the high value of criminal justice institution involvement in PV aspects. And this led my office also to be uh, much more engaged in a preventative strategy, of course, within our criminal justice mandate. 
And this is also the reason why we now rank third after UNESCO and UNDP in terms of uh, the world of UN projects uh, specifically are devoted to PV. Let me then um, at the outset just highlight some of these programming aspects and the capacity of building we do. And then I would turn on, the, uh, on some key points of the lesson learned uh, through those programs. First, I would like just to refer to our a major five-year initiative uh, against foreign terrorist fighter. This is a, a flagship project in assisting member states in terms of uh, preventing them to travel, but also in prosecutorial uh, and adjudication strategies. Uh, and at the same time, of course, we are now much focusing on uh, uh, returning FTF or relocating FTF and the challenges uh, there too. And in that context in particular, uh, we have uh, now looked much more at uh, elements such as disengagement, uh, of course rehabilitation and alternatives to imprisonment. So one of the key uh, elements I'd like to highlight is a new handbook that we are developing specifically on alternatives to uh, impris imprisonment for FTF returnees. This will be available quite soon. Secondly, um, I wanted to highlight also our major project that we are doing actually in partnership with OCT and the European Union on um, radicalization in prison. This is another key area where we think criminal justice institutions can be much involved in a preventative manner. And this is also based on a new handbook that we have released, uh, particularly to address uh, radicalization in prison and treatment of violent extremism uh, in uh, in prison and we are conducting a number of projects uh, all over the world. Um, this handbook is already available in several languages and of course these are we have more than 50 handbooks or capacity building uh, manuals that are available freely for all of you and for community uh, work. Uh, Father, we have uh, looked particularly at the issue of the uh, situation in the Lake Chad Basin countries and there we have supporting member states particularly to develop uh, prosecutorial rehabilitation and reintegration strategy for Boko Haram associated uh, individuals uh, and we are also working now on transfer of prisoner uh, mechanisms uh, in that region and more specifically also last year we worked specifically with Nigeria to develop an action plan for the vetting, prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration of persons uh, associated with Boko Haram. And now we are assisting Nigerian authorities with that. And of course, uh, the situation with children uh, who are uh, associated to terrorist organization, it's particularly at the core of our work. And we have started a number of new initiatives, particularly also with regard to those who were forced to travel with their uh, families or that were born in conflict zones that uh, present a number of very uh, significant legal challenges. And so there we have uh, created uh, this new initiative that have a three-pronged approach. At the global level, we released also another specific uh, relevant handbook on children recruited and exploited by terrorist and extremist groups. Uh, but we have also conducted a number of technical assistance initiatives at the regional level, for instance, for Sahel, Middle East, and North African countries, or at the national level, uh, Niger, Lebanon, and many other countries. And finally, just in this first part of my uh, presentation, I wanted to highlight also uh, our strong focus on gender dimensions. Uh, uh, and uh, we have also now almost fi finalized another handbook on criminal justice, uh, on integrating gender dimensions in criminal justice responses uh, to terrorism. And this is specifically to uh, um, assist criminal justice institution in address the problems caused by gender uh, exploitation, uh, sexual and gender-based violence, but also when uh, perpetrators are actually uh, women. What have we learned from all this project? Uh, let me highlight at least uh, six points that I would like to bring to your attention. First, we have to deal with a large number of individuals uh, that are FTF and many are now facing criminal justice systems. So while in some countries we have only few dozens of detainees, in others we're talking about thousands of people, and these require very specialized tailor-made responses. Just last week I hosted the Chief Justice of Iraq in Vienna, and we were discussing our 
support to them. And uh, uh, they have 12,460 ISIL associated individuals, out of which 700 are women and several hundreds are children. So when we deal with 12,460 people, uh, responses should be taken in, in this broad context. Similarly, in the Lake Chad uh, Basin countries, there are also thousands of people and we are in con continuous contact with authorities there, uh, particularly to solve some issues of detention and uh, those who are in custody under their authority. Second point, it's uh, still the fact that many countries think that imprisonment is the default or the only uh, means uh, for criminal justice responses. And uh, there is only limited recognition that uh, an excessive use of pretrial detention or prosecution tend to generate actually more uh, terrorism and more radicalization uh, and lead to re-offending. Uh, um, um, plus prison is quite itself a, a, an environment conducive to uh, radicalization. So. Uh, social integration uh, does not necessarily uh, require incarceration. And this is why we are uh, working quite a lot on alternative measures, uh, community-based treatment, community supervision, and data that can be decided through the criminal justice system. Thirdly, we have seen that there is a strong deficiency of the legal frameworks to support reintegration um, uh, processes. There is particularly a need to then uh, identify what legal challenges uh, are and also to facilitate interinstitutional cooperation. In many countries, uh, there are even fusion centers that have been created to ensure these interinstitutional responses. Actually, they are certainly a good uh, practice. Fourth uh, point I wanted also to mention is the need to carefully assess the risk as, uh, uh, posed by the returnees and their releasing communities, but also the concerns in the communities prior to any uh, decision taken to that. Uh, too often we see just projects taken uh, without this uh, uh, assessment. And for us, mapping has shown to be quite an important uh, aspect on how to collect information and more importantly, how to assess the preparedness of the communities to reintegrate and to accept these individuals. In some cases, there are a large number, as I mentioned, that of individuals that belong to the same communities. Are they prepared to get all this uh, back and, and released? Uh, do we need to go for uh, a decision to disperse them or rather to bring more resources? That assessment need to be taken prior to any measure taken. A fifth point is, it has been mentioned certainly, there is absolutely the need to work with civil organizations, uh, public institutions, but private sector and the communities. This is certainly on twofold approach. Mostly, I would say, even the families that are very important uh, partner in any reintegration process, but also uh, education of society and public opinion. Uh, uh, that is very important to create social awareness, also to break the barriers and the prejudice that have been already mentioned. And finally, my uh, last point, uh, it has been just mentioned also by Russell, there might not be a one-fit solution for all countries, and even more importantly, there is no one-fit solution for any of these individuals. Uh, we need to evaluate case by case each individual uh, and alternatives, uh, disengagement measures um, are rather to be decided by criminal national system uh, under the close supervision of relevant judicial and other uh, institutions. Uh, one option or the other uh, entail a lot of risk and consequences and no, only to a very careful assessment of the combated authorities we can be more successful in any other prosecution or release strategy. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you.